church. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. If you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 22 to 24. 22 to 24. If you want to go ahead and turn there, I would appreciate it. So today we are ending our sermon series through the book of Genesis. And uh, it's been a wild ride through the book of Genesis. It's been a great ride. And today, um, well, let me just quickly recap, actually. We've seen God create everything. that Before anything was God. Um, there's nothing that precedes God, nothing that, um, that doesn't exist, nothing that exists that, that exists outside of God's control. God created everything. He speaks and everything comes into being. He created everything, it says, in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. He created man. He created a woman. We created men and women. That's important in our day and age to, to understand that. He created marriage as a gift to his creation. He created man in the image of God. Every person has value, dignity, and worth because we're all made in the image of God. He planted a tree in the garden. The tree in the garden was to tell man that man does not operate on his own schedule, on his own uh, moral compass, but he is uh, called to live according to the word that God has given. We know the story. There in the garden, Eve was tempted. Uh, she fell in that temptation. She ate. She um, induced her husband to eat also. He was held responsible. They hid from God there in the garden. They saw and they heard about him. They hid from from the presence of the Lord. We're going to talk about that today. God says, Adam, where are you? I was afraid. Who told you you were naked? The woman, it's her fault. Woman, why'd you do that? The snake, it's his fault. Cursed are you above all livestock because of what you have done. Cursed are you, woman, in pain you shall have children. Cursed are you, man, the ground because of you. You shall have pain all the days of your life. We saw grace at the end of it. God covered their sin and their nakedness with an offering a garment of skins. And now that leads us finally to how it all ends. How it all ends, this beautiful paradise, Eden. Now we're going to see Adam lose that. We're going to see Adam get kicked out of the door. I don't know if you've ever been kicked out of a place before. I haven't, fortunately. I'm not very rowdy. I, 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 that wasn't really my MO. I think, uh, I think um, Adam, the, he... He really felt it here at the end. I'm just going to read for us. It says here in verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like us, one of us, in knowing good and evil, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, At the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Today we're going to talk about presence. We're going to talk about presence. We're going to talk about the presence of God, and we're going to ask two questions. What did we lose whenever we were kicked out of the garden? And then the second question, how do we get it back? What do we lose, and then how do we get it back? And so as we just read there, in Genesis 3, verse 22 to 24, the main thing we lost was the presence of God. We lost close relationship to God. Uh, Adam walked in the garden with God. There was no brokenness of relationship. He was fully naked, unashamed, perfect communion, perfect closeness. He was there with God. And now all of that's gone. All of that's gone. That phrase, the presence of God, is such a significant phrase, and I want to expand it for you. And we've talked about this in the past. In the past, Adam and Eve, they welcomed the presence of God, but now it's something that they flee from. I'm just going to read Genesis 3, verse 8. This is after they eat. And it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What an interesting way to say it. It's not that they hid themselves from the Lord God, but they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Now, that's the same thing, but my point and how I read it is God has a presence. You know that you're in His presence. 
It's like being in the room of someone that has much power. If you were in the same room as the president, you would know exactly where in the room the president is because he has a presence. You feel it. The room's different. Now, Adam and Eve, that presence that they would run to, now they hide from it because they know their sin. They know their nakedness. They know that they don't belong in that presence. Throughout the Bible, when sinful man comes into the presence of a holy God, you might think that that'd be a joyful thing. But if you read the Bible and and you see how man responds whenever he's in the room with God, you get the exact opposite. These people are afraid. The holiest of people. I'm talking about Moses. I'm talking about uh, uh, Isaiah. And then here in Adam, they get a whiff of God's presence, they get a whiff of God's closeness, and they hide. Genesis 3, 7, the eyes of them were both open, they knew that they were naked, they ate of the fruit, they knew that they were naked, they saw their nakedness, they tried to cover their nakedness, it wasn't enough. The first sound of God the next day or the next moment, they hide from His presence. I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 6, just to kind of build up the point I'm trying to make of the weight of God's presence. Whenever God calls out Isaiah in chapter 6, you might think it'd be such an amazing experience to see God be called by him to preach his word. But look at what Isaiah says. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. And let me just kind of back up. It's these texts. Whenever you read the Bible... There are just certain texts that you read and just the weight of the text comes on you and you just are blown away by how holy and exalted and amazing and mighty and different this God is. Whenever these people come in the presence of the living God, they're just, they're just so small. Read it with me in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So he's in an exalted position, he's above everyone, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So the robe is is sort of, you kind of think of it as his glory, his presence. In in the Old Testament, whenever God uh, falls upon his his tabernacle, his temple, he falls on a cloud. It's just, it's it's deep, it's thick. You can't even stand to be in his presence. It's just too much. Verse 2, And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. This is what the angels are saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So think about that. You're in the, he's in a vision. He, this is a vision. Okay, God exalted the robe everywhere. He's like, what the heck is going on? These six-winged angels crying out, holy, 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 holy. If that's not enough, verse 4, and the foundations of the threshold shook. Wow. Standing there, there's an earthquake that you might fall through the cracks in the floor. And you think, well, what did the earth just shake? No, look at the source, at the voice of him who called. God speaks, the whole earth shakes, and the house was filled with smoke. And look at Isaiah's response. And I said, woe is me. Wow. One look at God. One single utterance from his voice. And his response, woe is me. This is not a place I'm supposed to be. Now, we know that this side of Jesus, that's the glory of Christ, and we're going to get to that. But it still remains Isaiah. One look. For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He was just overwhelmed He was overwhelmed. This God is not like me. He is exalted. I do not belong in the presence of this God. Isaiah was blown away. 
Or what about Moses? Whenever Moses meets God for the first time in Exodus, Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush, Moses turns aside, he sees this bush burning, he's like, what's going on? It keeps burning? What is someone throwing more bushes in the fire to make it keep going? Why isn't the bush being burnt up? And this is whenever God comes to Moses, he says to Moses, do not come near. Doesn't, want God, doesn't God want us to come near to him? Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. Even the dirt is set apart by the presence of God. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And look at Moses' response. He hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is our exalted God. And this should impress upon you just how glorious it is that we have salvation in Christ Jesus. That we can approach God boldly with fullness of joy because of the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Whenever men of old, Moses and Isaiah, these guys were awesome, holy men of God. And yet, they cower. The presence of God. The point is that Adam is the original example of sin's effect on man. Of sin's effect on man. An example that continues throughout the rest of the Bible. I think about Peter. Whenever Peter comes into the presence of Jesus, he's on the boat, and Peter says to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. They just they get, it, they get a burden on them that something is different here. It starts with Adam here in Eden. It continues with Isaiah. It goes to Moses, and there are countless other examples. So I want to bring that context to bear on you. I want you to feel a little bit of weight of what Adam felt so that we can better understand God's response to man's sin. God curses the serpent. He curses the ground. The judgment on the woman. The judgment on the man. And now comes the end. Casting Adam out of his presence. We lost so much. We lost so much in the garden whenever we left this is what it says. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Let's read it again with new eyes. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and, eat it and live forever, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. The God of life, now trudging along, struggling along, trying to do life without him. What a burden. Now let's look at the text. First, notice that God is not talking to Adam. To me, that's interesting. He's not talking to Adam. Behold, the man has become like one of us. The time for talking is over as far as talking with Adam. God has said everything he needs to say. He said everything he needs to say to the servant, to the woman, to the man. He's not, he's not rendering um, a, a verdict on the man anymore as far as talking to him, although the, he is running a verdict on the man, but he's not talking to the man anymore. He's just giving the judgment. He's actually making a pronouncement to the rest of, of heaven, right? Look what it says again in verse 1. Behold, uh, verse 22. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So he's giving this announcement. Okay, heaven angelic being, heavenly host, this is what's about to happen. He has become like one of us. That phrase is important. That was the original temptation of Eve. Because the serpent came to Eve and said, you can eat of the tree. And Eve said, no, we can't. We're going to die. And the serpent says, you won't surely die, but you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And we talked about last time, the sneakiness of the snake is that he tells half-truths. She did become like God. God says so himself, but she didn't realize just how terrible that would be. This is the original temptation. Be careful what you wish for. It did not become what she thought. And because of that, she and Adam were cast out. God is addressing the angels here and giving them, um, a, um, giving them a heads up about what he's about to do. And this makes sense because 
Then he places an angel to guard the garden in verse 24, right? He, he places that weird, that weird text there in the, in the second half of verse 24. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword. I wonder what that looked like. Probably don't want to see what that looked like. Probably terrifying, right? Like Isaiah. You got this flaming sword that's turning every, like a sentinel, just ready to, ready to take you out. So he declares to the angels what he's about to do. And then in verse 24, it says that he drove out the man. It says that he cast men out two ways. First, verse 23, it says he sent man, the, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. And then verse 24, it says he drove him out of the garden. It's stronger language there. It's like, Adam, you got to get out of here. You can't stay in here anymore. This word drive is the same word used of Israel whenever they fled Egypt. They were driven out of Egypt. God drove them out of Egypt. They had to go, and they had to go quickly. They hardly had time to pack their bags. They didn't even have time to let their bread leaven. That's why we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. God told them to eat their food with a staff in hand and shoes on their feet because they were going to be driven out. That's how quickly it is. Same word used to describe the Canaanites being driven out of the promised land. This is not a place where you can stay anymore. You need to get out. And that's what happened to Adam and Eve. Now, what's interesting is the motive for God driving out Adam and Eve. We've already said that sinful man can't stay in the presence of holy God, that there's a problem there, there's, there's an issue there. But if you read the text, that's not what God says. God doesn't say, Adam, get out because you're sinful and you can't be in my presence. That's not what God says. Go back to the text. What's the motivation? Why does God drive out Adam from uh, the garden? Behold, the man has become like us, knowing good from evil. Here it is. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever... And then he cuts off mid-sentence. That's very interesting. You don't really see that, God cutting off mid-sentence like that. Why does he do it? Because he doesn't want man to live forever in sin. Because there's another tree in the garden, it's the tree of life. And if man were to eat of the tree of life, then he would live forever in a fallen state. There's something worse than that God sees. And this is really interesting to me. As terrible as it was that man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and fell in sin. To God, there's something worse. And that's to be eternally naked. To be eternally fallen. To be spiritually dead and yet never die. If man were to eat of the tree of life, he would be forever separated from God. And we have a word for that. That's called hell, right? Eternal separation from God. That was what's on the line. I can picture Adam there. I can picture Adam there in the garden. And he sees the tree of life. And he thinks, man, we really messed up. Oh, I shouldn't have listened to my wife. Gosh. Now, that's not always the best advice, husbands. You need to listen to your wife a lot of the time, okay? But in this instance, man, I shouldn't have listened to my wife. Now we're all, now we're all naked and God's mad at us and now we're we have death in the world. You know what? I remember that tree. Let me go eat of the tree of life. I'll go eat of the tree of life, and all my problems will be solved. Yeah, we messed up, but this tree, we're dead. This tree will give us life. Surely this tree will solve all of our problems. And that's just how sin works, right? That's just how Satan works. On the outside, something seems right. This is the solution. But then you get a taste of it, and you realize how wrong it really is. And at that point, it's too late. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. And so God, seeing that, God knowing that from this perspective, the casting out of man from the garden was an act of grace. Man's already demonstrated that he can't help himself around fruit. He's just a fruit monster. He wants to eat all the fruit that he can get his hands on. And so notice, God doesn't command the man not to eat the fruit, the fruit of the tree of life. He doesn't even put him in the position to be tempted, but he casts him out of the garden. 
so that he can escape a fate of being internally condemned into a perpetual state of fallenness. I think that's what's going on here. And then he places an angel. We were talking about that angel a little bit. At the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword. How terrifying is that? The only way back to the tree of life is you have to cross, cross paths with an armed angel. I don't know if you guys read the end of, of I think it's Second Samuel or First Chronicles, whenever David takes a census. Have you ever read that story? And he looks up and he sees this massive angel in the sky with a huge sword drawn, ready to take out the nation of Israel. It's terrifying. We get a, a smaller version of that here in Eden. God does not want man to make it to the tree of life. Again, an act of grace. And so he guards it. There's no slipping past this sword. There's no slipping past this angel. And there's important implications here that stretch all the way forward to Jesus and the gospel. We just answer the question, what did we lose What did we lose whenever we got cast out of Eden? And we lost the presence of God and all that comes from it. Life, joy, peace, everything that God offers us. We lost it all. Relationship with God. Now the question, how do we get it back? How do we get it back? And what we see here in verse 24 is this. The only path that leads back to life comes by way of death. If you want to get to the tree of life, It's guarded by a sword. It's guarded by a sword of death. And there are no exceptions. The way back to the presence of God where life is requires death. And it's here that we are reminded of Jesus. Here reminded of the gospel. Here we're reminded the good news. Matthew 16, 24. We know this text. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. What's the path of life in Christ? You have to die. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you want eternal life, you have to lose your life. The path to the tree of life is by way of death. You have to come under the sword. That's what Genesis 3 says. That's exactly what Jesus says. John 12, 24, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. For those of us in Jesus, we know that Jesus has come and he has endured the sword for us. That he came to Eden to follow the metaphor and came to the sword and to the angel and was struck there and opened up the path that we can walk to the tree of life and there eat so that it's not us, it's him. He endured it. There on Calvary, on the cross, he tasted death in our place and made a way for us to be welcomed back in the presence of God. For us, our tree of life is Calvary. And whenever we eat of our tree of life, we are eating the body and the blood of Christ. That's what communion is. That's what the Lord's Supper is. That is our fruit, if you will. And they are welcomed back in the presence of God where there is fullness of joy, pleasure forevermore. What we then lost in Eden, we gain in Calvary, the eternal life through Jesus Christ. But again, To get there, you must endure the sword. Jesus endured the sword. He took the punishment upon himself on the cross. He made a way for us to be back welcomed as children of God in his arms. But the only way you get that is through death. It's going to cost you. You have to look at the words of Jesus here. The life that Jesus offers you, it's free, but it's going to cost you every single thing that you have. You can't hold on to anything that you had once before. You've got to let all of it go. All of it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it whenever Christ 
calls a man, he bids him come and die. This was a man that was executed in a Nazi prison for fighting against Nazis, preaching them the gospel, preaching to his inmates that they can have salvation and that Hitler was not king, but Christ was king. If you want to follow Christ, you have to come under the sword. And, as, and if you don't, so I don't think people really get that. And so whenever they read these texts in the gospel that Jesus says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword, they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. I thought Jesus was all kumbaya and good times, right? No. He came to kill you and there give you new life. That's what he came to do. It's a trading of the old man for the new man. It's trading for the Adam, for newness of life in Jesus. The old is out, is gone, because you know what your old was? Outside of God's presence. That's what your old was. But the new is inside his presence. So the encouragement for you, I think from this text and moving it forward, again, we're, we gotta, we're, we're viewing from a gospel lens. There's a part in uh, the end of Luke, whenever the road to Emmaus, the two disciples are there, and they see this guy, it's actually Jesus, they don't realize it, and, G- and it says that Jesus explained to them all the things in the scriptures, the law and the prophets, concerning himself. Second Corinthians says that all the promises of God to find their yes in Christ. It's all leading us to Him. And so even here in Genesis 3, we see the path to life comes by way of death. Jesus accomplishes that. For you, it's the same thing. For you to follow Jesus, you have to come under the sword. You have to be severed from what is old to step into what is new. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says this, uh, this, Put to death, therefore. Put to death, therefore. Uh, Puritans say the mortification of sin. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked. I love that because you get the passive and the active. You once were this, that's true, but you still have to presently put these things to death. We are justified in Jesus. God has welcomed us. If, we, if you turn from your sins and place your faith in Him, you are good, man. You're in heaven. You are righteous. God looks at you fully satisfied in His Son. Praise God. You've got a place in heaven. But you're still on this earth. And you're still called to put to death what is not Christ that still clings so closely fully justified, but presently sanctified, presently being worked on by the Holy Spirit, being conformed to the image of Jesus so that our sanctification will finally be equal to our justification whenever we go to be home with the Lord, whenever we come back to that paradise that we lost whenever we gain it back and that's the beauty of the bible there what we gain on the other side of this is actually greater and more glorious than even what adam had because it's not a garden that we get it's a new heavens and a new earth that we get it's a new city that we get a new jerusalem that we get where there is no sun because there's no need of a sun because the glory of god is the light of this new place where we go where the ground is gold that's where we walk Jesus has opened up that path to you. It's the path of life. You've got to walk in it. We lost the presence of God, but we have gained it all back in Jesus Christ. Now, that's the gospel. That's salvation. We know these things. We see these things and how it helps us interpret Genesis. But I think there's another way we have gained back the presence of God. Certainly in salvation, but another way that maybe you haven't really thought about before. What about God's presence on this earth right now? I know that we all have God's presence. If you, if you believe in Christ, God's Spirit resides within you. God changes our heart of stone to a heart of 
flesh. It says he puts his spirit that causes us to walk in his ways. That was the promise in the Old Testament. You see that in Jeremiah. You see that in Ezekiel. We have the Holy Spirit within us. But what about unbelievers? Where are they going to find God's presence? Are we just, is Adam just, I mean, Jesus is a long way from Adam. Whenever Adam was kicked out of the garden, did God say, hey, just wait a few, you know, thousands and thousands of years for my son to come? Where is his presence today? Where will we find the presence of God? Can his presence be found on the earth today? The answer is yes. If you continue in the biblical story, this is, this is the God of grace. God drove man east of Eden out of grace, but then he also goes to man east of Eden out of grace. He, it's not like he says, Adam, get out of here and then see you in a few thousand years. That's not how it works. God will be found amongst his people even while they are still fallen in sin. And again, how can that happen? I mean, you saw Moses. He saw God. He was terrified in Isaiah too. He was terrified. How is God going to do that? How is God going to be amongst his people even in this frontier of fallenness that we presently reside in, even east east of Eden? You figure that God would kind of just be done with us, kick us kick us out, lock the gate, throw away the key. But that is not what he does. It's almost like he puts, it's almost like he puts the angel there east of Eden and says, hey, look after the place while I'm gone. Almost like that. Maybe you could say that. I don't know. Maybe we'll ask him one day. I want to take us now on a journey through the Bible to connect the presence of God and how we see it manifested in, in the scriptures, the milestones of God's presence on the earth, and then we're going to land at a place that maybe you don't quite expect. Now, let me just say beforehand, as we start through the journey to see where God's presence is, I don't mean to say that God is some type of genie in a bottle, that he is confined to this place or that place, and you've got to rub you know, the bottle the right way, and then God comes out. What I'm saying is that God has told us the special places that he has chosen to manifest his glory. And that's the key phrase that we need to key in on we're going to see. God has chosen specific places, and I use that term with quotations for the last one, to manifest his glory so that it's not all, you know, God is under the rock, God is over here, God's over there. God is everywhere, but he has particularly put himself specific places places that's important for us to understand the first place is eden we already saw that that's where the presence of god was the second place the book of exodus i would encourage you all to read the book of exodus i would encourage you all to read just the whole bible you know i just got to read it i don't know what else to say just sit down and read all of it you got to i mean there's no other if you're if you're a follower of christ you're a book person Maybe you don't like reading. Like reading. I don't know what to say. Pray to God because you have to read it. There's no other way. You have to read it. And you can listen to it, but read it and listen to it. If you continue in, in Exodus, the, the book of Exodus is about, and most of you guys know this, the book of Exodus is about God's deliverance of his people, Israel, from slavery in Egypt. And he brings them to Mount Sinai, and there Moses is with God Mount Sinai, Moses gets the Ten Commandments, and then God instructs Moses to build a tent that will serve as his dwelling place, okay? To build a tent that will serve as his dwelling place. So as Israel is sort of roaming around the desert wilderness, the Israelites are going to erect a tent where they can meet with God. This is called the tabernacle. This is where the presence of God will be for them. But what's interesting about the tabernacle is it's a lot like Eden. If you read it, it's kind of like God brings a mini Eden to Israel in the desert. Again, God of grace. The important point here is that Eden Eden was where the presence of God was, and the tabernacle is where the presence of God was. I'm just going to read this, Exodus 40, verse 34. These are the texts you just have to key on. 
So they're in, the, they're in the wilderness roaming around. They finally get this massive tabernacle built. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So remember Isaiah. He couldn't even hardly stand to be there. And now in the, Isaiah is way after the tabernacle time. But with Moses... The tabernacle, the tent is set up. God's glory falls on it. He fills the tabernacle. The tabernacle was arrayed in gold and precious stones and images of angels, just like Eden. The tabernacle had a gate on the east, just like Eden. Just like Eden. And then we already said this, the tabernacle was where the special presence of God would be found, just like Eden. The priests were called to keep and to guard the tabernacle, just like Adam was called to keep and to guard the Garden of Eden. In spite of sin, God will be found amongst His people. As you go through the Old Testament, this is where God presides, in the tent. So they're kind of roaming all the wilderness. They finally get to the Promised Land. The tent is set there in Shiloh, and it's there for a very, very, very long time. And then eventually God puts it in the heart of David, to build a, a temple. To build a temple. Being the second place, I guess the third place. The second place amongst the Israelites, the third place established in Scripture of God's presence amongst his people. King David prepares for the temple. He gathers together all the resources. His son Solomon actually carries out the construction of the temple. And then we read the completion, Second Chronicles 7, verse 1. And notice how it's similar to the tabernacle. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It's the same thing of the tabernacle. The glory filled the tabernacle. Now the glory filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory filled the Lord's house. The same thing with Moses. He couldn't stand in the tabernacle. The same thing in the temple. The priest can't even be there. It's too much. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. So you see the same thing. God's glory descending from heaven, first as a cloud on the tabernacle, second as fire on the temple. In both instances, the glory is so heavy that the people couldn't even stand to be in the same room. They're driven out just like Adam. Driven out. That's how heavy the presence was. So now we've gone from Eden to the tabernacle to the temple. If you know the history of Israel, they don't stay faithful to God. What's so interesting at the end of Deuteronomy, they're, you know, they, they were supposed to go in the promised land. They don't. They're sentenced for 40 years in the wilderness. They finally get back to the promised land to enter. Moses is about to die. He says, these are my last words to you. And he says... You know, you need to listen to God. Don't listen to yourself. Listen to God. And then at the end of Deuteronomy, he says, but here's the deal. You're just going to you're just gonna rebel against God again. It's, it's so disheartening. <laughs> they go through all this, get ready to enter the promised land, and Moses says, I know that you're not going to listen. I know that you're not going to listen. And that is what happens. Israel doesn't listen to God. They rebel against God. They don't stay faithful. They resist him. And then in Ezekiel chapter 10, something horrible happens. I'm not going to read the whole text, but what we read in Ezekiel 10 is that the glory of God leaves the temple. God removes his presence amongst his people because of their sin. Because of their sin. So we get to the end of the Old Testament and we're thinking, where is the presence of God now? Where will God's presence be amongst his people? When will he return? And then coming to the New Testament, John 1, 1 to 2, and verse 14. And notice how similar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That Word is Jesus, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. See that? 
glory. So the glory that fell on the tabernacle, the glory that fell on the temple, now the glory has fallen in this earth in Christ Jesus. We have seen his glory, the presence of God amongst his people, no longer in a tent, no longer in a temple, but now in flesh, walking amongst them, glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's presence amongst his people in flesh and blood. How amazing is that? The word dwell there, and the word became flesh and has dwelt among us. It literally means to pitch a tent. God tabernacled amongst us through his son, in his son. God pitched his tent, flesh and blood. Tent. Jesus, the incarnate presence of God. So, we've gone from Eden, tabernacle, temple. Now, Jesus, presence of God. But it's here we stop. Because we know what happened to Jesus. Is Jesus still here? Is his body still here? Is he still walking around? He had the shortest, if you want to say that, period of God's presence, I guess. Three years or longer, I mean 33 years. But three years of public ministry. I'm sure the tabernacle and the temple, were, they were longer periods of time. Jesus was crucified, Jesus resurrected, but then he ascended. So where is the presence of God now? Where do we see God's presence in this frontier of fallenness now? And this is where I want to bring it home to you. The presence of God is right under your nose. The presence of God on this earth as it was and is now, is now in the church. It's the church. Whenever I say church, I don't mean, I guess I kind of mean, but I mostly mean this. We often think universal church. I'm part of the universal church. What I mean is the local church, the gathered church, the unimpressive church, the church that drinks coffee in the morning, okay? The church that comes together and sings out of tune, whose microphones don't work, right? This is where God has now chosen as the special place where he will manifest his glory, How incredible is that? That you see him fall down in the tabernacle, you see him fall down the temple, it's too oppressive, his presence to even stand in there, and now he's chosen to do that directly in his people. Not in a place, but in a people. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's Spirit dwells in you. Now, we read that and think, me. The word you there is plural. It's a plural word. He's talking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you, plural, are that temple. The presence of God is here. The church is the presence of God in the frontier of fallenness that we call this world. Just consider the majesty of the temple and tabernacle arrayed in splendor and gold and jewels and fine weaving. His glory manifested so strongly and now God says that glory is manifested here. It's almost unbelievable, right? And it's a greater glory than the glory that Moses saw. 2 Corinthians says that there was the ministry of death in the time of Moses, but now we have the ministry of life. And then the glory that we had before has now been overtaken with the greater greater glory, that we are ministers of a new covenant. It's the glory of the redeemed in Christ, that God could save all people from their sins through His Son. That's the most glorious of all glories. Ephesians 2.20 it says, we, the church, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the book of Acts, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, they're preaching the gospel, in whom the whole structure being joined together, not singular, plural, together, all of us, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together, listen to this, into a dwelling place for God. God's dwelling place amongst his people, the church, by the Spirit. 
Where does God dwell on this earth? He dwells within his church. He dwells within us. The church is the only thing that Jesus promises to build. Matthew 16, I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock, on your confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We are not going to lose. The church is not going to lose. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. We are the presence of God here. And what that means is that the church is the greatest hope that this world has. Now, I'm going to say that, and you're going to say, Jesus is the only hope of this world, and that is exactly my point. We are the presence of God in this world. In our contemporary culture, where we talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus, I think we've pushed that to the point where we've forgotten the church. We need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You have to. You have to personally repent and believe. But I think we've pushed that to the point where the church is optional, where the church is viewed as a nice supplement to what I personally have going on with Jesus. The church is a nice way to help me get deeper into my relationship with Jesus. That's not it. Whenever you are saved, you are baptized into a body. You are not baptized into your own Jesus body, personal. You are baptized into the greater body of Christ. It talks about in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are living stones joined together on the cornerstone. Whenever you read this, it's not singular, it's all plural, built together, combined together. Why do you think we are dedicating these children to God? This is a public thing because we are called to do this together. That's where the presence of God is. And in my opinion, this is why we've seen so many fall from the church in these post-COVID years. If it's a singular mindset, then I can get my Jesus fixed by watching a sermon online or via a live stream. I'll just stay at the house, stay in my pajamas. I think the reason for that is because pastors have not done a good job of teaching about what the church actually is. It's not an activity. It's not a way to keep your Sunday morning an activity for your Sunday morning. It's not, it's, it's so much more than all of that. It's not even all the good fellowship, although that is a blessing of it. And learning and growing your faith, that is a part of it too. It is in the church where the presence of God is in this earth. The church is in the presence of God and the gathered people of God, the glory of God in our midst right now. And that's what's so beautiful about our text today, to bring it full circle. You have this fallen couple from paradise, and God, His amazing grace, has now come to this couple. He has sent them out, but He stays with them, and He stays with them, and He stays with them, and then that couple grows, and He stays with them, and that couple grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And now we have the church, a mixed multitude of redeemed sinners all over the earth, all over the earth, that whenever we get to heaven, Every tribe, nation, and tongue will will speak. What a beautiful truth that is. This is how Genesis 3 ends. Cast out of God's presence. But we are of good comfort because we know how the story ends. And even in knowing how the story ends and experiencing the end of the story, salvation, we still await the final ending where Eden gives way to a new heaven and a new earth where the church unites fully, finally, and forever with our King where death finally gives way to life for all time. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for Jesus. He is the cornerstone. There is no other salvation. There is no other name. There is no other power, Lord. And there is no other people. The people are the people of God, your church, your people that you have redeemed. I just want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to know and experience your presence to know and experience your presence. I I pray that your presence will be manifest in this place as we turn to you in repentance and faith. I pray that for those that don't know God, that don't know you, that have not turned from their sins, I pray that they would. I pray that they would see their sin, Lord. I pray that they would see their Savior. I pray, Lord, that they would feel your prompting of the Spirit to repent and believe, Lord. And then I pray that you would bring them into this place, this church, and use them for your glory. We lost so much in Eden, Lord. We lost so much. But the beauty of the gospel is that we have gained it all back and then some. 
I lift up these people to you from the smallest to the oldest, Lord, the youngest to the oldest. I just pray that they would deeply feel you in their hearts, their minds, deeply feel you, Lord, in their lives, unmistakable. My God is here. He is here. He is with me. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he has sent his son, God with us. And now I'm amongst his people, God with us. Impress that upon us, Lord. Jesus, our cornerstone, we love you. We thank you. We pray these things in his name. Amen.